the great work forum and the question responses about six months ago i did some of these responses and the moderator of the site kindly asked me to do some more and i'm afraid there's been about a four month delay i'm sorry for that there have been reasons i think my youtube channel has become very popular and is attracting um criticism from the more conservative elements within orthodontics that would like me to stop so first we have a response to Yegor L. So Yegor L says, he's got two questions. He says, first, you have said that an increase in the ramus length accompanies maxillary change. What are the actual mechanisms forces that cause the ramus to increase in length in conjunction with these changes? Well, let's first of all identify exactly what the ramus is. So this section is the ramus here and this is known as the body of the mandible and <clears throat> i think the overall distance from here to here is approximately set genetically I, I think these things do change but not by a great deal and not in most normal situations what i think we're doing is we're changing the relative lengths of the um the ramus and the body i show you this image here and I think it's the difference between these two shapes, where the overall mandrel length for these two subjects is also most the same. However, the arch length differs by 14 millimeters. So I think that's roughly, I think, what's happening and leading us to have crowded front teeth and impacted molars. And if you really look, you've got this section of the body of the mandible, sorry, this section of the ramus, or should I say the gonial angle? It's much more that the gonial angle is just sort of moving back like that. So the gonial angle moves back like that. And when I think about this, what I'm thinking is, in part, this is because there's only so much corridor for this section, the ramus of the section, to enter into the skull. There's a lot of important structures. In fact, every structure in this area is very important. And the, that pathway in is relatively, well, it, it, it's not adaptable it, it can't change much so what you've got is you've got that pathway in and that's really it so really i think it's not so much the um ramus that's changing it's the body of the mandible is just hinging up and down depending on how much space there is uh, it's a little bit more complex but the fascinating thing is when you do see the angle of the mandible go backwards it it it, 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 it well it's not obvious what the mechanisms for this are um yeah it, it's amazing when um when this where well, you can say that the muscle controls here but then what makes the anterior segment so if you look on this bit here um this distance from here down to the angle of the mandible it, it does get slightly larger and bigger heavier mandibles but as the ramus the sorry as the angle moves away this area here also moves away as you see here this structure moves away creating more of a angle on the inside the mouth but clearly making space for the wisdom teeth and this sort of um anterior border we would call it the anterior edge of the ascending ramus it seems to head back and I, I, what controls this i literally have no idea i i really don't understand why that goes back um and we, I, I use this as another sort of example here that you can see how the whole face drops down and it, it drops down and back. And of course, what we see is how the incisors teeth move so far, but the molar teeth move in an exaggerated amount. And that's because you've got this change in the width of the dental arch. So as the width of the dental arch does that, the molars go back further. But I don't fully understand all the mechanisms controlling this, and I think it would be some time before we do. Um, Yegor posed a second question. The second question was, um, also, does the growth associated with mewing happen through 
through mainly through such structural growth or through gentle skeletal remodeling? Now, this is a question I really want to answer because so many people have posed similar versions of this over time. Now, I've got a CT scan here. Clearly, you can see if you're looking carefully, one side of this, uh, one sinus, his left or her left sinus is um, full of fluid. And clearly, there's a sinus issue going on here. But otherwise, the, 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 the anatomy looks OK for a normal, modern individual. Now, what we see here is we see five plates of bone above the maxilla. We've got the outer uh, sort of outer border of the maxilla where it's going into the zygomatic process uh, points. Um, it's the outer border of the sinus. Then we have the inner border of the sinus, the outer wall of the nasal cavity. We've got the septum and then it repeats the other side with the outer wall of the um, um, nasal cavity and then the outer wall of the maxillary atrium, the outer wall of the maxilla. So we have these five structures. Now, if you are functioning well and you're not held artificially in orthodontic braces, then all of these five structures are going to be aligned in a good architectural manner. I remember seeing an image through the head of a femur, the sort of ball joint, and they were showing how the um, spicules of bone had all perfectly lined up in this beautiful arrangement to take the stress and the loading. And when you look at this arrangement, exactly the same. You've got the stress and loading is perfectly transferred by these structures. These There aren't any step joints. There aren't any unusual bends. These are all in the right place. And as long as you are functioning and posturing correctly, you aren't held artificially in an artificial position, all of these points line up. Now, what is important about this is that, yes, you can get sutural growth. I mean, you can see some sutures on this skull. I mean, I think this is a relatively young individual. She looks like these, these are baby teeth with some adult teeth about to erupt underneath. So this individual will have more open sutures, which was a good example. But you can see the suture here in the top of the um, palate, the mid palatal suture. You've got various other sutures around. And if, I don't think it makes a lot of difference in the long run whether you get sutural growth or skeletal remodeling. I think that a lot more noise is made about the relative merits of either of these than is necessary. In the long term, I don't think it's going to make any difference. Those bone plates are going to line up to where the stress is running through the skull, irrelevant of how they originally got there. So in fact, if you widen your dental arch and then function and posture correctly so that strain and stress is going through those teeth, it's all going to line up. And then who really worries about how you got it? Now, there's a caveat to that, that if you get some um, increase in the nasal cavity, space quickly and immediately from skeletal um, expansion, this can help you breathe better, that can create a virtuous cycle of change. And so that can be an advantage. But I don't think it makes a lot of difference. And I think well, there's a lot of fuss over nothing on this. Then response to poor posta, I think. So in long faced individuals, the typical vertical maxillary excess means that more maxilla is present downward. In this case, is maxilla just shifted downward, but the overall length of the bone is normal? Or more simply, the maxilla grew more downward, making it overly long too? Now, what I've done is I Clearly, I often go online to find images, and it's always interesting when I go online and find one of our own images. I've seen this set of images all over the place, and I actually found this on someone who was trying to raise funds so that he can have some form of corrective surgery, because he says through no fault of his own, he got maxillary excess through poor orthodontics. That's an interesting subject. Anyway, these are two sisters. They're not twins, as I've often heard said. Their heads aren't in quite the same orientation, so be careful about trying to make a direct comparison between them. 
I think what happens when the maxilla drops is it drops and the forward display of cheekbone becomes less. So it drops down, it drops back. So it maintains approximately its own volume. Approximately, I don't know. And I think it then becomes longer and thinner as it drops down. And I was always fascinated with the work of Harvold when he placed this uncomfortable plastic wedge on the roof of the mouth for these monkeys. And what they noticed is that the without the tongue supporting the maxilla or the palate, the maxilla dropped. I dropped by was it 1.4 millimeters a month for any of the groups. So the, the growing males, the growing females, and non-growing females all dropped by the same amount, or shall I say the same rate, which that fascinated me. But as the maxilla drops, of course, everything else is going down. It's a bit like you're morphing the face. So the whole area under the eye also drops down, and the relative distances try to maintain themselves. However, I think that the maxilla, as it drops, it is getting longer. It's not maintaining um, the same forward dimensions, certainly. And I think that often I say that if you were to disarticulate a skull and place all the bones on the table and then compare a long-faced individual with a, a perfect-faced individual, I think you would struggle to notice from any one of the bones that there was a great deal of difference, possibly with the exception of the maxilla and the mandible, but still they would be less deformed, shall I say, and more change in relationship between each of the bones. Now, so we have a response for porpoise and he says, if the face has grown vertically and the maxilla is back and down, is it possible that the nose is longer than it should be? Very, very interesting question. So I did a little bit of hunt. They had this sort of nose awareness event to, you know, it's like people saying it's okay to be fat. It's okay to have a big nose. It's okay to be lots of things. And to some degree, I would agree with that because people are the way they are. You can't turn the clock back and they, a lot of people are going to have to accept how they are. Now, I think that the image um, centrally of the man with the moustache shows a classic person whose maxilla and mandible have fallen down, making his nose look larger than it really is. I would actually say that that nose is smaller than it should have been. It's bent backwards a little bit. However, he the nose does look larger, and that's because of a lack of support. The girl, however, her nose looks distortedly big. And I think that's because during this campaign, they artificially elongated noses. I mean, the, the, the whole nasal opening, it just looks wrong. And the whole nose looks too far, too big. And that means, I think, that that sort of um, ability of our brain is saying to us, that looks wrong. And so that nose is too big. Whereas I think in most situations, the noses aren't too big. Clearly, there will be some genetic variation. But I don't think I've seen many people whose noses are actually too big. It's usually the maxilla that's too far down. And of course, we're going to illustrate that. I mean, we must you must be familiar with these slides. Here's good growth and the nose doesn't look so big. Here's some poor growth. So you haven't got the tongue on the roof. You don't have the indirect forces. So the direct force of the tongue should be on the roof of the mouth. The indirect force of the teeth biting together should hold that maxilla up. And then you'd get good growth. It doesn't. The um, maxilla drops down. Of course, you lose the angle of the ramus. And you gain this antagonial notch. That's this little patch just here which is called an antagonial notch, the gonion being the angle of the mandible there. But I covered this earlier on, and I think that that, that entrance into the skull is going to have to be similar to this entrance into the skull. What's happened is that the front, this section from here to here has effectively dropped down. And But then what people do is, as Marcotte noticed, they always have this point here directly above this point here. So people upright their heads and of course if you're going to upright your head you're going to make your nose and you don't have a maxillary support then you make your nose look larger than it really is. So then we go on to the response to Sharp. Sharp says 
in your view, is it more what is more important for a person to comfortably hold correct tongue posture, lateral space or intermolar width? Um, now I'm struggling a little bit um, sharp with this response. Um, we, I, I don't, the lateral space, I mean, that's the intermolar width. I, I can't really, I mean, if you mean the lateral space between the teeth, right, that's no, you should, cause you'd have your teeth together. So that space shouldn't exist. I, I don't quite understand the question. Then we have response to Emily. So if someone wants to seek treatment in addition to mewing, in what order would you recommend it? Plate expansion, face pulling, reverse headgear, or many others. Well, I think that if you, you're not close to me and I'm not taking many people on, I would recommend you had the ALF therapy. So this appliance here. And the reason I do this is I would recommend this as an upper and lower jaw. It's slow. It will only help you to change, but it keeps all your teeth in nice working order. The way they bite together, as I say, you don't break the buckle segment. Make certain that the practitioner you're working with knows what you're trying to do, is familiar with what I'm saying. Ask them to make some gentle expansion. Offer to say you'll take twice the time they want. That's all you want, the expansion from the out, no more. And it's gonna help you. I often make the analogy that if you're walking up a hill and someone gives you a hand to get to the top of the hill, they're gonna help for about 30%, but that's it. You've got to do the rest of the work. Don't imagine you can sit on your backside and something will happen. There ain't no magic. It's hard sweat and tears. Now, response to Apollo. So we've got two questions from Apollo. This is question one. We've got a lot of questioning. Um, does shifting the maxilla up and forward change the position of the lips in relation to the teeth? For example, does it reduce gingival exposure or hide more of the teeth under the upper lip when smiling? If not, does the soft tissue shift up or fill out as the underlying skeletal structure moves up and forwards? Does the fulcrum length decrease? Should those without any gingival exposure or gingival exposure in the back but not the front mew differently to prevent more of their teeth from being covered when they smile? Well, quite a long question there, Apollo. Now, my think, it, from my observation, it doesn't really make a great deal of difference. I have a couple of times tried to reduce the gumminess of someone's smile and sometimes I haven't. And so reviewing back the cases where I haven't and the cases where I have, if I've got a good successful case where someone improves their oral posture and function and does so for a prolonged period of time, everything works itself out. I sometimes get a little bit just it's sad to see some surgeons who are talking about they're going to move this, they're going to do this, they're going to... Well, this is all them, 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 them. This is what they're going to do to a person. Well, if you get someone's posture and function right, it works itself out. I know that you're starting from a position that's not ideal. And, some, you know, there's a lot of water gone under the bridge. However, I, I've, my strong feeling is you stick to the basic principle rules and it does work itself out. That's my hunch. I can't say so much when people are just doing this without therapy that I'm providing or when they're a little bit older. Then Apollo made a second question. He said, does a Taurus palatanus and or buccal extostosis have any impact on adult palatal expansion. Going on, is it still possible to separate the mid palatal suture with the torus palatinus? And then will palatal expansion reduce the prominence of either the torus palatinus or the buccal extososis? Now, fascinating questions. Now, I've put a picture up here of a buccal extostosis. The, you also can get lumps up in the roof of the mouth, uh, which will be palatal tori, or down on the inside, either side, you know, sort of inside from here, called um, mandibular tori. Now, 
<clears throat> no one really knows why these are created. Some people think they're genetic, but that's the great old excuse when you don't know, isn't it? And what you've got is a build-up of bone and it probably something to do with stress because that's usually what does build bone up, you know, stress through the bone. And that can be caused by, you know, people being stressed, but it's normally through excessive work and effort. Now, I have a hunch with these things that it's when you have a disconnection between two positions, your rest position and your functioning position, that you get the most of these building up. So you rest with your tongue slightly between your teeth and you come to bite together in a slightly different position and then grind in that position because that feels a little bit strange because it's not where you've been resting, it's where you bite. Now, I think that may help to explain um, both the tori and the extostosis. However, I can't be totally certain. I don't think I've ever had a situation where I couldn't gain palatal expansion because of a mid-palatal um, torus. The tori can cause me lots of problems down the mandible when I'm trying to put appliances down there. So that can cause an issue. Usually they occur in an age range that's beyond where I'm working with. So I don't see so many of them. Now, whether or not they would reduce if you widened out the dental arch, that is interesting. I suspect that as you would ride, widen the dental arches, the reason that I feel they're there for would go away. The tongue's less likely to be between the teeth. So it's more likely to be up on the roof of the mouth. The teeth are less, more likely to be together or near together at rest. So I think that this dichotomy that I'm concerned with would go and they would then reduce. But they're not going to reduce because everything's moved out sideways. I don't think that's going to make a lot of difference. Okay, then we have a response to SIND. Interesting what, name, a handle, whatever you call it. How much do you think our ancestors chewed in terms of duration and toughness compared to modern humans. Did chewing take up significantly more time a day compared to today? What is the role of raw versus cooked food in this equation? Did they eat raw food more often? Finally, what would you say was the official, or oh, sorry, the typical average gonial angle of our hunter-gatherer ancestors? Okay, so for the first question, did our ancestors chew more? Yes, they did. Go back to some of the monkeys, and it depends whether these monkeys are fruit eating, which was our relatives, our ancestors, so to speak, or where they were leaf eating, which well, I think our ancestors branched off of. The leaf eaters have to eat most of the day. They're going for it most of the day, where the fruit eaters can probably get away with about 30%, maybe less eating. Remember, that's 30% of the day. You've got a 12 hour day because of sunlight duration, which is, you know, we've, we've changed that due to artificial lighting. So if it's 30% um, of the day, they are 12 hours, they're going to be eating for about four hours approximately. Now, we think that to remember where all the trees would come in season at any one time and where they were in a forest helped stimulate the human brain so that we could then live only on fruits. And that was a trick no other animal could do because it couldn't remember those things. To them, it was chance if there was a fruit tree in season close to them. Whereas our ancestors, we suppose or suggested, actually could make a mental map of all the trees in the forest all the times of year when they would be in season. So could gently make their way around the forest, um, living literally on the fruit and honey. The beginning of decay, I would imagine. Now. Did chewing take up a significantly more time in a day compared to day? Yes, I think we've asked them that one. What is the, what, well, how tough was the food? Well, I think some of it was exceptionally tough, but a lot of it was just basically tougher and just more fibrous. Next time you eat asparagus, cut off the bottom third. Well, we normally cut off the bottom third and throw it away. Try to chew that up real raw. What I found I was doing was I filled my cheek with this sort of what you would call a bolus in the true sense of the word. And the, then I would grind the um, uh, asparagus as it went through my teeth. 
sucking the goodness out of it and then having post-tested it i'd push it into this cheek and once there was no more goodness i passed a couple of times through i then spit out this big lump of the fibrous stuff that was left over now i think that's how our ancestors were coping with all veg everything we have in our supermarket today vegetable wise is a uh, being hugely hybridized hugely um distorted crossbred i mean we they weren't we, we haven't we weren't doing any genetic engineering but we were doing a lot of crossbreeding so what you see on the supermarket today really doesn't reflect where these vegetables or fruit ever came from in the first place I remember seeing a presentation where someone showed me the sort of the ancestors of oranges that apes were eating. And these were tiny little, very hard things with it. It were incredibly astringent. They were bitter, really bitter. Nothing of the sweetness that we, we expect in fruit today. So that was the sort of vegetable segment, which was just a vastly more of it. It was much lower calorie. You had to eat a lot more of it. What do we think that sort of 60 plus percent of the calories of hunter gatherers came from the, um, the what, what the women were bringing back, the, the gathering? And a smaller but slightly more vital percentage was coming from what the men were bringing back, uh, the, uh, the meat. Um, now, I'm not trying to be sexist. I just believe that's the way it was. Now, you then go on to ask, what is the role of raw versus cooked food in this equation? Did they eat more raw food or would they eat raw food more often? Now, yes, I think it's a clear, obvious answer. We, When you go to switch on uh, your electric cooker or your gas hob and press the button and it instantly lights up, you, you, you're so far removed from how our ancestors were that I think it's very difficult for us to really understand the concepts of what was going on. I think that within a group you had, um, you would probably have several fires in an evening, as I've been told. Um, with mixed family groups sitting around the various different fires, maybe one larger fire, particularly at ceremonial times. But, and you probably kept a fire going for a lot of the time. But to actually cook on this fire, I think it's, you know, it requires fuel, it requires time. We didn't have anything, you know, without metals, you couldn't put anything onto the fire. It's quite a difficult process cooking with fire if you don't have pots and pans. So I think, yes, we did a huge amount more chewing of raw food because it was laborious, time consuming, expensive. It was difficult to cook things. So we often ate the food raw. It was it was the easiest way to do it. And I think that the whole sign of kind of meal setup that we now think of as normal was completely different in the past. When you killed an animal, you ate the animal, so you would have meat. You would have no, <laughs> but then nothing came with the meat, and except I guess if the hunter gatherers had brought back some veg, you might eat them at that moment, because otherwise they went off, but you ate the meat because otherwise it would go off. And you'd probably have a meat feast for a couple of days of eating more or less nothing but meat and fat and blood and you know, you'd grind the, you'd break the bones open to get the marrow, you took every last little sliver of goodness out of whatever animal you'd kill and you would probably try and dry some of it so that you could use it in the future if that was appropriate i, I don't know it would be there'd be regional variations now the um the, the, then you would have then when you hadn't killed an animal you would just eat anything that came in so when the, the um, gatherers came home you would just eat whatever they had. So if something was in season, you would have a lot of that stuff until it went out of season and then something else would come into season and you would continue in this manner. And of course, as we move from the equatorial climates to the um, more northern climates where you had seasons, then we had to learn the concept of um, preserving um, the, uh, the gathered material and even the hunted material as well. Okay, so then Sin goes on to say, finally, what would you say was the average typical gonial angle for our hunter-gatherer ancestors? I, I don't have a figure on me, but a lot more acute than ours. So more acute, more like mine. But 
interesting i have seen some ancient skulls that weren't as acute it was, it was almost more rounded and if you look back to some of the um uh, neanderthals they had more they definitely were more rounded in this area so i don't think that you know we, this this sharp angle that we're we think is attractive i don't think that's necessarily truly indicative of um, our ancestors i think there was a range but it was certainly more acute than most people today so response to laggy what's your opinion on reverse extractions procedures for premolars on the upper and lower jaw now i would love to make a little video nothing really will work as good as a video but i think the problem is that if your jaws have down swung and collapsed trying to extend them in this direction here is not really the answer to be honest i i'm not big on opening up spaces i want to get an upswing in craniofacial form i want to get a, a what we would refer to as an auto rotation a uh, non-surgically so a um auto rotation orthotropics i've called it trying to get the face to move up and forwards and then don't open spaces why do you want to open spaces here i want everything to move up and forward i often think about the, the dentures so the set of teeth you know your upper and lower teeth um not the dentures that sort of like granny takes out and leaves in a glass overnight but the denture as in the, the, the a true latin form of a denture you know the upper set of teeth with its bone the bottom set of teeth with its bone that needs to move up and forwards it on mass as we say a good medical phrase the whole lot moves to move up without creating any space remember if you're going to create any space to push the front forwards you're going to push the back teeth backwards and i don't think that's necessarily helpful it's not going to get you anywhere to make that space and you will worry about what you're going to put in the space if you put implants in the space well then you're going to really restrict your ability to gain f further movement because the you're restricting you're placing something in there that's fused to the bone so my suggestion is don't open spaces up just work on your posture get everything moving up and forwards clearly that i would make a caveat there that if you want more tongue space sometimes opening spaces can assist with that then we've got some questions from abdul abdul you've got two questions you say that in my vancouver presentation that was in 2016 i discussed the headgear and hybrid plants what was your reason you would choose one over the other for a patient is it their initial dental arch width or additional factors well here is the an image of the hybrid appliance at the top you'll see it's got a screw on it it's got these fangs or soft locks that i've made great modification to in the last year below that you've got a girl wearing a neck gear now the reason i would use neck gear is it will get me i don't just use the neck gear on its own the neck gear is going to usually be used with an upper removal appliance and a lower removal appliance as the preparation phase of the classic orthotropic system so this is my big main system so i'm not choose you know it, it, it's it's the hybrid has been created to be a sort of orthotropic light so what the hybrid does is it trains people to keep the mouth closed and it works to get some more expansion the problem is that if you don't have enough width within your if you don't have enough tongue space volume if you then go and throw a large volume occupying brace into the mouth people won't be able to cope especially because you're now asking them to keep the teeth together whereas in the past lots of them would rest with their tongue spreading laterally between the teeth and of course if you're going to allow that then you've got more vertical dimension within the tongue space so we're, we're reducing the vertical dimension by bringing the teeth together we're insisting on that or forcing that with the soft tissue locks the fangs and it's only when they're wearing it well can we start to widen so they have to go through this period where it's very uncomfortable so not only do i mind closing them vertically pulling the tongue out from between the teeth but i'm also shoving in the volume of this appliance some people can't cope and because they can't cope my rule of thumb is unless you have an intermolar width in the region of 35 you ain't going to, be able to cope with that but one of the advantages with this appliance is it maintains the way the teeth on the side back meet together we call i call this maintaining the buckle segments or is being conservative with the buckle segment 
Now, if I'm going to be conservative with the buckle segment, if the bottom jaw is set back half a tooth unit or two tooth units or even quarter of a tooth, half a tooth unit, let's say, I'm not going to bring, I'm not going to change the relationship between the back teeth. So if the bottom jaw is set back or the bottom jaw set forwards, I'm, I'm not going to change that because I'm not going to break the buccal segment. So if I have an individual where the top or lower jaw is back or forward in relative terms to each other, then I have to use the classic because there I'm independently working on either the top jaw or the bottom jaw. If I don't have to do that, if I'm just simply going to take someone as they are and gain some width to them, then I can use the hybrid. But the hybrid is my attempt to make sort of orthotropics light. I'm, remember, I'm still really using these on younger people or young people. Then, um, Abdul, your second question. So you say, given the palatal expansion increases the dental arch width by expanding the maxillary bone from the suture, which is your presumption, what other effects can be expected? Does the procedure also expand the nasal passages, for example? Well, I've put the same slide that we used before because it's the same question almost. I mean, you might get some expansion at the suture. You will always, there's always a mix. There's never, you know, it's never isolated one or the other. There's always going to be, more or less, there's always going to be a mix. So if you gain some expansion in the maxillary arch, you are likely always to get a slight improvement in the nasal um, cavity. Um, you know, it, it does many other things, I think, if you gain some good expansion, but it also can upset the way the teeth bite together. So then that can reduce your biting force and that can be negative. So expansion isn't all wonderful. And that's why I say often it's beneficial to preserve the way the side teeth bite together. Be conservative with your buckle segments. OK, so response to chronic. I'm interested in how rampant you think inferior oral posture is becoming in modern society. What sort of percentage of people would you estimate to having great bad mouth breathing posture? Why do you think there is such prevailing ignorance, obliviousness, or oh, tough word, on the topic despite it being so potentially devastating? Surely this will be taught at home and school. So, Krolik, I'm giving you the star award for the best question so far. Um, uh, yeah, yeah, you sum it up. And why is there so much ignorance? I think twofold. I think a lot of people have headed off following the Western price concept that it's diet. Now, I don't counter that it's not diet. Diet doesn't have some element in it. But it's clearly not the whole picture. And I think that function and posture are considerably more important than diet. So anyway, so a lot of people have headed off in the wrong direction and not, you know, not considered the broader perspective. Then clearly you've got a lot of vested interests who are just fixing the symptoms of these problems. Then I think society has really got to wake up to the fact that the way you look, that person that looks back to you in a mirror is not always the full genetic potential has not gained their full genetic potential. Um, how else do I put it? I even uh, am delicately phrasing these words now. Everyone's faces are messed up. I mean, how else can I put it? I mean, it, it's, it's something people don't really want to admit, or realize, or I mean, it, it, just people don't want to get it into their consciousness. And it's it. this is often the crux point that we have to you know, open people's minds to. And of course, sorry, I jumped onto the end of the question, but how rampant is it? It almost complete. I mean, we go from the people with the very best looking faces who I see on a television or you see in the magazines. They're not perfect. And they're, they're pretty good. They're pretty good, but they're not perfect. Then we go down to the um, indigenous peoples I'm seeing. They're not perfect. And of course, they've always got to shut. They've got a metal knife. Now, before you had that metal knife, how were you incising teeth with your incisors? Huh? You're doing this. Oh, that's all right. So just give someone a metal knife and you've instantly massively changed how they are. You know, and I mean, we, we don't even think about this. Um, of course, give them clothing. Then he's not going to have to make his own clothing. So, um, 
you know, the, I don't think there's many people who haven't been affected. And then clearly you can see some greatly affected people. Now, <clears throat> should this be taught at home and in school? Yes, of course. It is my firm belief that if people went through the mealtime exercise for an hour a day, every child sat up properly following these fantastically new rules that no one has ever, ever heard of before that I completely made up of elbows off the table, sit up straight, eat with your mouth closed, food to you, not you to your food, um, chew your food properly, have good body posture when you swallow, doing a bit of a chin tuck, I might have helped with that one looking straight forward to engage other people in conversation. Now, yeah, that's not new. And in fact, I think that it's probably one of the best examples of a parallel cultural evolution that has ever occurred. I've yet to find anyone from any culture anywhere on the world where they have tables and chairs or use tables and chairs where they don't enforce that routine, almost exactly that routine. And yet our ancestors divided and separated way before we had tables and chairs. I mean, people were crossing the Bering Straits to populate North America and then move down to South America. People were heading off to Australia. They were heading fanning out through the Russian steppe. They were populating Europe before we had tables and chairs. And yet how can we have all came in all societies to exactly the same technique there's a reason and i think that reason is because you could see the village idiot you could see how that would prevent your child from not growing well not growing straight so i think that there's, there's a huge amount in that and if you do that for your child for a meal you know you need to sit down as a family have dinner all your children sitting up straight then i think they should do some chewing because i don't think that's going to be enough in a modern society you need some uh you know uh, exercise well, what makes muscles big exercise some replacement therapy and i think chew gum chew gum every child should chew gum for at least an hour a day from four years old if not earlier it's screen time is chewing time simple if you don't if you want to watch you've got to chew simple that's it there should be no, no question minimum of hour every day lips together and with good body posture so I'm um, that's that's all for this moment in time. I'll come back. I'll make some some time. As I said, you know, things have been a little bit difficult at the moment. I think as ever, I will turn this my way because you can't stop the truth. You can't stop me asking the simple, basic questions. The primary question I'm asking is why are teeth crooked? That's a scientific process. I want that to continue. I will make a comment. Um, TGW, you asked a question about some specific bits of equipment that I'm using, not necessarily for their original use. Now, I'm not going to talk about that because I know I'm making patients fully informed of what the use is, but I don't want to alert the manufacturers to the fact I'm not always using their equipment as it's prescribed because that can worry manufacturers. And so I won't. Sorry, I'm going to miss your questions out. But I will then come to the other questions. Could you keep them a little bit more short and distinct? There were some quite heavy questions there that uh, just quick to one, two liners that you think that's interesting. All right, listen, thank you very much indeed. Um, hello to everyone, all the moderators, Karen and all the other mo um, moderators who work really hard to make that site work. I think it's really good to have a grassroots community focused on these things, helping people because that's what people need. They need help. And this is where you start getting help from. Thank you very much.